good afternoon everybody thank you because we have a really good group um, i mean my big group can you please um keep your mic for now unmuted okay just to make sure everybody to have a feedback my name is Shana jacques i'm the outreach manager for pss of Health care again i want to welcome you all today and we have pam and stefan today for a very important and important and enjoyable um, topic. So some rules, we're going to use the chat if you have any question, and we're going to wait at the end to use, our, um, to, um, I think Stefan's going to um, wait at the end to answer all the questions, um, if you have any. Um, again, thank you. Um, Pam, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Shana, and thank you all for joining us today. We hope to have a pretty big crowd um, because we have a very famous guest. <laughs> yes. And we're very privileged to have Stefan Deutsch with us today. I'm manager of Coming of Age. Uh, Stefan and I met maybe three, could be four years ago. And we always talked about uh, partnering and doing something together. And this opportunity came up and he was amenable. And I know you're going to enjoy hearing what he has to say. As Shana said, we're going to hold questions until the end, or you can put them into the chat before, uh, before we end. So let me introduce him today. Stefan, along with his partner, Dr. Johanna Vandenberg, founded Creative Aging in 1980, well ahead of its time. He was invited to present the results of his theoretical and clinical work to both the American Medical and the American Psychological Associations, where it was very well received. He's presented his theory of love as an essential piece missing from present day psychotherapeutic interventions at major national and international conferences. His theory has been integrated into child development, uh, parenting, K through 12, emotional intelligence, marriage enrichment, divorce mediation, personal and corporate wellness and aging. He has maintained membership in several professional societies, including the Gerontological Society of America. So he knows something about aging and aging positively. He's also been called the father of love and you will find out why when you listen to him. I'm pleased to welcome Stefan Deutsch, president of Human Global Development. Hello, everybody. It's so nice of you to join me. Um, we have a lot of stuff to go through. Um, a couple of theories, uh, uh, looking at paradigms in general and then specific to aging uh, as a possible solution. So uh, uh, we're going to have about 35 to 40 minutes at the end for Q&A. So we're going to have plenty of time uh, to answer all of your questions. Uh, what I would recommend if you're one of those uh, that uh, likes note taking or to make sure you remember your question, uh, let me give you a minute to get a, a piece of paper and a pencil. So maybe you can just quickly jot something down. Uh, as uh, Shana said, uh, we can also do uh, the chat box, but uh, we have so much uh, material to cover that I'm not going to be able to look into the chat box again until really uh, the end of the, uh, the presentation. So uh, having said that, uh, again, I apologize. I'm squeezing a lot into a short period of time, uh, but... Um, uh, the end agenda basically is that we will discuss the whole concept of paradigms and how important shifting the paradigm as far as aging is concerned. And then we'll go, we'll go through my theory of human development and lifespan, uh, out of which came my theory of love. And I'm going to give you proofs because people like science. They like to know, you know, is, is this some concoction or does it have, is it rooted in science? So we will do that. And then I'm going to tie it all together for you. Uh, and then we'll finish with the Q&A. We, we should have again about 35, 40 minutes, perhaps more. So um, again, as you will hear, uh, it is 
nature's plan. It is nature's plan to, uh, to leave the best for last. Now, some of you may already been feeling that, but uh, this talk might take you even to a whole other level of the best is yet to come. Now, as you will hear, I'm advancing a theory of lifespan that inspires people and creates a continuous momentum to move us toward personal growth and greater power as you navigate into and through the third stage of life. As it always is, ideas do win the day. The third stage of life should be what we all look forward to and not something that we're afraid of. Now, what about the idea that the aging population is actually our most valuable and under re, re, underutilized resource? Can we afford to lose such a valuable resource to retirement activities when our growing aging population has the potential to transform the world? And I mean that seriously. We need a course correction. We need a paradigm shift. So how do, how do paradigms work? I don't know if you remember uh, how cool it was to be, uh, to be a Marlboro man. So let's look at it. First, smoking was cool. Kids imitated their parents in secret. And then science reveals that smoking kills. Cigarette packages start carrying a warning. And you can see it on this uh, upper left-hand corner. You know what it says? Smoke contains carbon monoxide. Nothing about lung cancer, nothing about death. Then planes and restaurants uh, start implementing smoking section and, and then finally ban it altogether. Buildings and hotels become smoke-free. And then the National Ad Council starts running a campaign now for decades. The, the, the last iterations are showing people with holes in their throat, not very inspiring. So we moved from smoking is cool to smoking is dumb. And it took four or five decades. Shifting the paradigm is slow, but it works. And it's all about educating the public. Could aging ever become cool? something so cool that we actually look forward to it even after 30? Yeah, I think so. Again, it might take a few decades. So what is the present paradigm of aging? There's a certain self-fulfilling prophecy that's at work because our misunderstanding of lifespan, especially aging, everyone knows that sooner or later we die most people need something powerful, inspiring to look forward to in order to dedicate the time and effort to get a better aging result. And certainly it's not death. Since death is inevitable, how do we inspire people to take control of their third stage of life and get more out of it than they ever thought was possible? Decades ago, Johanna Vandenberg and I founded Creative Aging, a nonprofit, and then we, we were slightly ahead of our time. The graph you see was one of our studies. We asked a couple hundred people between the ages of 40 and 70-ish to draw a line on this graph depicting their satisfaction with life at different stages, how, how they thought about it. The vertical index is people's perceived satisfaction. The horizontal index represents people's age from birth till 70 years. 13% drew the red downward line, meaning life starts on a high point and goes downhill from there. 9% um, drew the orange line. Now it doesn't get better, it doesn't get worse. And 78% drew some version of the, grill, the, the green bell-shaped curve feeling that 30 to 40 are the best years of our life. And then it kind of progresses down from there. Nobody drew the blue line. 
<laughs> That's why we put it in there. Not much has changed as far as the general public's view of aging is concerned, except for the minority, and you're part of it, who are aging well and now form groups like the Great Panthers, the Great Panthers and Coming of Age. So let me ask you, if you had the ability to create the human experience, would you put the worst part at the end? It didn't make any sense to me, to be honest. I thought the end should be the best part. When the final curtain closes, we're exhilarated and get a standing o ovation. You know, what, what, what else? <laughs> so I believe I discovered why that may in fact be possible. Our concept of life. So let's take a quick look at that. What the chart above depicts is that 91% of the general public has accepted the inevitability of decline. And that kills our passion for making the life changes and commitments that would keep us healthy and vibrant. What does acquiescing to this image of aging leave us with? Well, for many of us, kind of a quiet hopelessness. We try not to even think about it. Is it inspiring? I don't know. Now, the fact is that we have evolved over thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Has purpose of life also evolved? Do we have a different purpose? Let's take a look. In the physical stage of evolution, like the first million years or something like that, life was purely about survival, finding caves, food and water, and guarding against predators, both humans and animals. In the mental stage of evolution, maybe the last 10,000 years, those problems were lessened somewhat, farming, domesticating animals, building fences around communities. Survival was more certain. And then what we started to do is think about tools and how to make life easier at our jobs, at home. We, we wanted more time for fun. And today we want longer, a longer, healthier life. We want more toys, entertainment. We want to be just like uh, royalty used to have it <laughs> in a way. All right. So is there all there is? You know, that's the question. What is the present model of human development? Well, we have a body and a brain and they do decline. But we have a saying, you know, use it or lose it. And it's true. Research has proven it. But is the job then, if that's all there is, a body and a brain, for the rest of our lives to use body and brain so that we don't lose them? Is that it? Or is there something else that supersedes the physical and mental and developing it brings us to another level of satisfaction, control over our life with closer relationships and better health and longevity? So now the question is, what are we missing? What is the last stage that was intended to be the high point? Was it? What if it was? Okay then the challenge is where to start. So let's look at today's approaches to aging, the, the, the paradigm. We have uh, one approach uh, that is to study people who are aging successfully and prescribe their lifestyle to everyone else or telling the general public positive aging, conscious aging, successful aging, creative aging. Another approach is to insist that the answer is better nutrition, exercise, meditation. Another is to insist that we not use certain terms when referring to older people. Now, all of these help a little. Humanity's aging population is exploding and we need to have a solution that excites and inspires people to want to engage in a healthier aging process? What if they knew that we are depending on them to make a tremendous contribution to the mental, emotional, and physical health of others? With the side product being that they also prevent many of their own possible illnesses and mental decline. Yeah. 
So how about changing the paradigm? How about theorizing a third, even more powerful developmental stage that awaits us all? Wouldn't that inspire human beings to look forward to aging, engaging in their own health, immersing themselves into the new adventure this developmental phase promises? Well, that is exactly what I did. So, and I call it the stage of the self. Now, when we look at this, we can see uh, a 10 year olds want to be 20. Why? 20 year olds can't wait to be 30. Why? Well, they're always looking forward to something, something incredible. So how about one, aging brings us to fully experience our incredible potential. Hmm. How about two, aging develops our true power to touch and inspire others. And three, aging is cool. Yeah, the coolest. All right. So what inspires hope? Let's take a look at this. If people thought there was something truly worthwhile waiting for them, would they take better care of themselves? So only real inspiration can change the habits and life views of the average person. You know what? Yes, the stage of self ordering Kuhn. I don't know how many of you have heard of Thomas Kuhn, but he's, he's probably the preeminent philosopher of scientific and social progress. And basically this is what he said, the greatest impediment to the advancement of science and society is what people think they know. Like there's only a brain and a body. Like um, aging isn't cool. It's a declining process. There are things we knew. No, let's take, let's take a look at some other things that we knew. Well, we knew that the earth was the center of the universe. No. Uh, they were going to burn Galileo for that, right? Or the four elements, air, fire, earth, and water make up the material universe. No, atoms do. Atoms do. And that was postulated 2000 BC, but not believed till 1850. That stress and lifestyle have nothing to do with illness. No, they have a lot to do with it. So today we are, we are going to look at the body and the brain model of human development and why it may not be sufficient. So what we want to do is basically change the paradigm, right? And this is where I was a moment ago saying, aging brings us to fully experience our incredible potential. Aging develops our true power to touch and inspire and to love and aging is cool. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to come to a place where I really need to go through theoretical things. So please stay with me. Uh, I hope to make it uh, as short and sweet as possible. But um, yeah, the two theories is the theory theory of lifespan and, and human development and the theory of love. So as long as people believe that aging, the process of getting old is basically a declining experience, especially after 40, followed by death. Most attempts uh, uh, with, uh, by groups uh, like positive aging will, will inspire some, but not inspire the general population. We will be stuck in retirement mode. There's nothing wrong with babysitting our grandchildren, traveling, reading, volunteering and dealing with financial and health issues. But again, is there more? The solution is to redefine the aging process as an ever upward arcing process, experience, where we know that the best is always ahead of us. Not only define it, but prove it using common sense and our experiences so that it can withstand attempts to dispute it. The theory of lifespan as it continues moving towards greater power as we age. Uh, 
Despite the obvious decline of physical strength and a strong, strongly contestable decline of mental capacities blamed on aging rather than lifestyle, I believe the best is yet to come. In fact, it's what potentially awaits each and every one of us. So now I'm going to go into the theory, uh, the continuum theory of life. And basically I posit three stages of development overlapping but distinct, as well as three developmental parts of a human being, the body, the mind, and the self. With all three starting their development at birth, they develop to their full potential at three different stages during a single lifespan. So the first stage is that of the full development of the body. It takes place from birth till about 20, 18 to 20. It's visible, we can see a human being grow. And so it's easy to accept this as a stage of human development. This stage is characterized by human beings having what I call a body-centered perspective on life. The driving forces of development at this stage are, what is there to eat? Who can I play with? I'm tired. What am I wearing? How do I look? Who's interested in me? So forth. So the predominant preoccupation is to look at the world and see how it can address the needs and wants of one's body. The second stage is that of the mind. So it's not a coincidence that college starts 18-ish to 20, right? And it goes between the ages of 20 and 40. This stage is characterized by human beings having what I call mind-centeredness. That's the perspective, their perspective on life. While issues of food, looks, relationships, of course, are still important, the driving force uh, of development at this stage are ideas, interests in discussing religion or politics, uh, economy, poverty, corruption, racism, gender. We call young adults idealists. They are preoccupied with ideas. This is the second stage, usually accompanied by a clearer understanding of the consequences of one's aging and one's uh, uh, choices and actions. So is this it? Well, if we are only a body and a brain, things we can see and touch, and then yes, aging becomes about maintenance and using what we have developed. But interestingly, something happens around 40. It is called the midlife crisis. People start questioning their lives, unhappy with careers or marriage or their religion themselves. They start asking new different kinds of questions. I believe that these behaviors coincide perfectly with the start of a third stage of development, which is potentially the start of the full development of the self. It seems like a crisis only because we're not prepared emotionally for yet another developmental stage. People also wanna know how to become more aware, mindful, how to express oneself more effectively, compassionately, how to envision our future moment to moment with clarity and how to love unconditionally ourselves and others. Take a close look and we can see people going through changes at this age. If we are only a body and a mind and these have been developed fully, we should be by all measure leading a happy life. Yet many people who are successful have been married 15, 20 years, are still unhappy, dissatisfied with their careers, their marriage and themselves. Based on the present body-mind theory of human development, this should never happen. So there's something wrong here. There must be another part to human being that is experiencing the facts of his or her life with some level of frustration and pain. And this other part is what is ready for its full development. Only a relatively few of us turn towards developing their self fully. They seek happiness, seek answers, try spirituality, new religion, but not usually how to develop their capacity for unconditional love. 
those who don't take this inner journey wind up with addictions, medications to either escape the numb, the numbing of the, or they try to numb the pain, uh, and which comes with an undeveloped self that is guiding their life and making poor decisions, ruining potentially loving relationships. So when we look at how the, fu uh, the functions of the body, mind, self, the body is for locomotion, manipulation of objects, housing of the brain, and ingesting and using energy. The brain is for communication, language, reading, writing, mathematics, logical and ethical thinking. Since I'm positing a self, what is self? What are its muscles? What is its role? Well, here it is. Uh, this is a Venn diagram. And this has to do with what we can fully develop. And again, uh, people who've turned inwards and are looking uh, have probably come upon ways to start developing some of these. And when I looked at midlife, at the point the brain completed its full development, I observed the following. Uh, awareness, we aren't connected to, not fully aware of our relationship to ourselves. The inner journey of self-knowledge, which infants, by the way, are born with, is discouraged rather than developed. It's sorely lacking. Most people start psychotherapy at the midlife crisis point of their life, around 40. Vision, we do not know how to use vision for our everyday lives or relationships. We only set clear goals when large sums of money are involved, like buying a house, a car, going on a vacation. The only vision we ever encourage to have is about a career. What do you wanna be? Because that has everything with earning money so that we can become self-sufficient. Foremost with what? Well, buying food and nourishing ourselves, right? And then there's the communication piece. You have all heard about our primitive brain, the amygdala, which activates the fight or flight response. So we learn to defend ourselves, which is the opposite of listening. And we only vent because we're not able to frame a loving communication when problems arise uh, so that another one can actually hear us, even if it's uncomfortable for them. Uh, a 50% divorce rate is one measure of, of the issue we have with communication. And then finally, unconditional behavior, which we don't talk that much about. People do not behave unconditionally towards themselves or others, in spite of the fact that all of us need love unconditionally. Many people believe that it's not possible, yet that is what we give infants. That, of course, is totally wrong but it is certainly part of the human experience. The fact is that human beings have the capacity. They love their infants unconditionally. However, as soon as children pass the terrible twos, that love that they got becomes conditional, even from parents. The problem is that even adults need unconditional love just as much as infants. Since we don't know that and we weren't trained to behave unconditionally, we behave conditionally, mimicking others. And that damages all our relationships, including the one we have with ourselves. I concluded that these four were the muscles of self. We know how to develop the muscles of the body and brain, but we don't know how to develop the muscles of self. And inadvertently during childhood, we even damaged them to some degree. And uh, these muscles could be developed starting in childhood. Uh, but uh, what happens is that psychotherapists, uh, you know, again, around 40 is when uh, they start to help uh, human beings develop these. Uh, and, and unfortunately, their work does not include teaching their patients unconditional behavior. So let me jump ahead here a little bit. Love is something you cannot buy for any amount of money. And yet we can all generate an unlimited amount. We all have this capacity and give it away for free. Love, this nourishing energy is in short supply and sorely missing from the world today. Unconditionality, the ability to behave unconditionally 
under any and all circumstances requires the developmental tools of awareness, vision, and communication. It is in the third stage of life that our ability to be more aware and vision moment to moment, communicate effectively, and love unconditionally can be developed fully. Giving love away freely and abundantly is both the most rewarding thing a person can do, and guess what? The healthiest, and something people who do loving things like volunteering can attest to. Additionally, the inner peace it provides is central to helping our telomeres stay long, which is the key to longevity. Nothing touches people more deeply than love. Nothing heals more than love. So when you become someone who can love unconditionally, even approximated, you will become the most powerful person to all who know you and the most appreciated. So you wanna talk about power? You heard me say that word a number of times. So let's take a look at which is the most powerful stage of human evolution and, and human development. So we study three different groups, right? Human evolution and human development. These two both mirror each other, the macro human evolution, the micro human development. We can learn about human development in a single lifespan by looking at human evolution over hundreds and thousands of years. Now, we study three distinct historical figures, groups of figures. Those who use physical power, yeah, they're part of our history, conquering others, killing and all that good stuff. And basically this is how far their undeveloped self took them. We don't hold them in high regard at all. We also study people who used mental power, inventing things, discerning the physical realm. And in many ways, they made our lives easier. So we hold them in higher regard. Do you know who the third group we studied and hold in even higher regard? They didn't use physical or mental power and yet still have a profound influence on humanity to this day. It was a group with a developed self. They were very aware. They all had vision. They all communicated extremely effectively and they cared for and loved humanity unconditionally. Yes, Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King. There were many others and there are many amongst us today. So, which brings us to my theory of love. What does a theory of love have to do with aging? Glad you asked. The answer is everything. It is becoming more and more evident that love is not some romantic notion, but part of the family of nourishing energies like air, food, and water. And this discovery not only has the power to change the way we treat ourselves and others, enrich our relationships, our health, but give greater meaning to life, especially to the third stage of life. But before we go there, let's see what evidence there is for this groundbreaking new theory. And by the way, this is my colleague, Barbara Fredrickson, who published 2.0 and concluded after eight year research, love is nourishment like air, food, and water. Yeah. Why does being a grandparent feel so good? Because for most of us, it is the first time we are actually able to behave in a way we want to and need to, the way nature made us. And that is unconditionally. We explain it, you know, we don't have to discipline and correct uh, like we did with our own children. Now we are free to just enjoy our grandchildren. But really, truly, what we really mean is that we can give free reins to loving. That's why. And let's take a look at some more science here. What about cancer survival? Well, it turns out that if people have a larger loving, supportive community, they survive cancer 40% higher 
And these all come from research studies where the citation is here on the bottom. And I'd be happy to share those citations with you. Also, tissue regeneration, oops. Let me see if I can go to the previous. No, it's not gonna let me, okay. Tissue regeneration uh, and, and, and also the shortening and the lengthening uh, longevity studies uh, uh, show that when we're loving, uh, this is what happens. Uh, this is the next slide, uh, psychosocial dwarfism. A loving home environment helps children produce more growth hormones. Without love, their bodies and brains don't develop fully. Uh, my colleague, Tiffany Field, who discovered that when preemies are massaged three times a day by their mothers, their growth rate increases 40%. Again, everything with citations. So people still think of love in the romantic sense and, and, and feel like there's something called romantic love. And science has basically uh, taken a look at this and says otherwise, okay? We, we define love as an essential nourishment. Then there is no such thing as romantic love since hormones and chemicals produced during romantic interactions are not nourishing. So this is the physiology of romance. It's a biological ed energy generated involuntarily and it attracts us. It's important for procreation. It's a very strong energy, but what it generates is dopamine, adrenaline, serenome, serotonin. Uh, it's driven by pheromones and it does not nourish versus the physiology of nurturing love, where what we're talking about is something life-sustaining. It nourishes us. It's generated by conscious behavior, and it is the root of thriving. So what are the chemicals and hormones? Oxytocin. What do we know about oxytocin? Well, besides being called the love hormone, it is essential for our uh, whole system, our immune system, so that's where less illness and longer life also, endorphins, vasopressins, but we have to be conscious to be loving, especially to be unconditionally loving. What Luby's research showed was that uh, nourishing moms, uh, their children developed their hippocampus uh, at, at a much higher rate. And with that, uh, again, uh, uh, they were able to, uh, control their emotions, emotional regulation uh, was part of her research. So when I work with my clients, uh, I give them two lists. One is uh, this list, uh, which generates loving energy and we can feel it in the room. We can feel it when we interact with somebody, when they're encouraging, appreciative, affectionate, considerate, respectful, etc. And I also give them this list so they can begin to monitor and mentor themselves. Uh, when we do this, we're not even conscious of it. When another person feels hurt, uh, you know, we poo poo it, you're just being too sensitive, uh, but it's there. And so becoming aware is a very important part of being able to love unconditionally. Uh, Eric Fromm was one of the, the most noted noted and notable psychologist in, in the history of uh, the world. So uh, this is what he wrote based on his observations. Human beings are starved for love. I, he didn't mean it uh, literally, he meant it figuratively, but it, it's literally true. It's literally true. So let's take a look at uh, another way that we can tell that, uh, love is a nourishment. How long does it take before we sense the absence of food, for instance? Well, four or five days, a body goes into starvation mode, painful. What about with water, dehydration? Two or three days, again, the body sends us a message uh, that we need water, air, maybe a minute or two, uh, oxygen deprivation. What about with love? when it's not there? How long does it take you to sense that something somebody's doing or saying is 
not loving. You don't sense it. And I will tell you over 30 years of work, people said, takes a second. It takes a second. Uh, how is it possible that our organism can tell when love is present and when love is absent unless it was a nourishment like food, water, and air? Nothing is more essential. Imagine an adult population who perhaps did not get unconditional love in their lives and now have the opportunity to learn how to bring unconditional love and with it health and happiness to themselves, their families, and humanity for the rest of their natural lives. Is that the purpose of life, to get to this stage and to be able to do that? What an incredible blessing to be able to provide the most important nourishment people are literally starving for. And we're talking about seven and a half billion people. And it's true for all of us, no matter where I traveled, no matter who I spoke to, it was true. They didn't feel they were getting enough love. They felt loved by some people, but it wasn't enough. So love is the only thing you can't buy at any price. And it's the only thing we can give away abundantly. And it costs us nothing to do it. The fact that the world needs love has been written and sung about for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, somebody even said, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we usually ignore as yourself. It's a very important part because we do love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we hate ourselves, that is the way we interact with our neighbor. It turns out to be the most important important insight into the nature of hum human beings is scientifically meaningful and true. Finally, nature designed us to be the most capable of becoming unconditional in the third stage of life. Yeah, to be aware, to, to be able to envision, to be able to communicate, and to behave unconditionally. So roll up your sleeves and get to loving all those around you, of course, first and foremost yourself, but make sure you develop your awareness, ability to create vision, ability to communicate, meaning framing effective and listening proactively. I just have really, now the question is, do you feel like the best maybe is yet to come? Is that the way you feel? You're gonna tell me in a minute. Uh, and we have two more slides to look at. Um, when I was working with Johanna, uh, we came up with a, a term called life pro. And I'm really curious about what you think about that term versus all the other ones out there, elder and so on and so forth. Maybe it's a little too, uh, uh, not commercial or whatever. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to talk about a uh, receiving part or uh, of this presentation, uh, you can send uh, an email to president at thdc.org. If you want to find out more about our work, it's at love-decoded.com. And my book called Love Decoded is on Amazon. And now if I can figure out how to end this, oops, oh, well, here's my book. This is what my books looks like. And this is the app we're working on. So we even had that. Uh, we do have a, a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, how do you recommend a therapist teach patients unconditional behavior? Uh, well, I'm kind of an expert at it because I start there. Uh, uh, when they come to me, Jacqueline, how are you doing? Society for Psychotherapy Integration or Psychotherapy Research? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I just saw your name and, uh, and I, I just got excited. I think we were together in Switzerland or some other place like that. There we go. Uh, uh, the, the way we do that is I assume, uh, unless I think that uh, someone has a, a real, uh, what I would call, psychological mental illness, uh, which uh, then I refer them out to specialists. But I assume that when people come with they're not happy with this and that and relationships and so forth, that one of the things that's missing is that they don't love themselves enough. And I actually ask a question and that question is, what are your lovable qualities? It's one of the first things I start with. And you know what? Some people say I don't have any. And that's, that's the clue, that's the key. 
Uh, and what they have when they work with me is permission to actually look at themselves. Now, you could call it positive psychology, but positive psychology doesn't talk about love and doesn't explain love is nourishment and doesn't explain that part of growing up is to become self-sufficient with our air, our own air, food, and water. That becomes our responsibility. And so has love. Love has to become our own responsibility, behaving lovingly with ourselves, respectfully, kindly, patiently, appreciatively, accepting our, our good qualities and our flaws. Uh, so uh, to maybe put it simply, I, I just tell them you have to learn to become your own best friend. But then you have to understand why you were best friends with other people because we're more or less unconditional with them. So uh, it seems that's, many yeah. people, um, I think, do not really um, know how they are observed by others and they don't know their own value because somebody likes them, but they don't know why or they mm -hmm. their friend may. And I think, uh, uh, too, if someone isn't in therapy, how do you generate this kind of a development of, of love uh, for, for solo agers, for people who don't yeah. have much contact with the human? Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, uh, you, you can get the book. What has happened, because we have something called apps and, and everybody has a cell phone, is I, I was told uh, by a group of my colleagues four years ago, uh, actually when the United Nations came out with a warning about a, a mental health epidemic way before the pandemic, but uh, they basically turned to me and said, Stefan, uh, uh, people need to have you in their back pocket 24 seven. And so for the last four years, we've been working on an app and we are almost there. And that means all of the things I would be talking about are right in the app as a course, uh, constructed as a course, a college course, whatever you want to call it, a course. And it takes people through um, uh, 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 that relationship with themselves, including, you know, what are your lovable qualities, your self-talk, what are your less than lovable qualities? How do you envision? How do you communicate? Uh, how do you mistreat yourself? Have you not forgiven yourself? So it takes people through all of that. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that that would be, you know, the, the best way, you know, at present uh, that I, I could say that uh, because, uh, and, and we're also teaching therapists. Uh, we have therapists who are interested in becoming part of the organization, uh, interested in using the app for their clients and uh, they're being certified uh, to, uh, to understand. And this is none of this is rocket science. I mean, uh, both of these theories are about as simple as they can be and part of our human experience, you know, so. Uh, we don't have, you know, nobody has to be a rocket scientist. You don't even have to be a, a psychotherapist to understand this stuff. I would invite anyone who wants to ask a question of Stefan to unmute yourself and feel free to ask the question. Just unmute. This is a lot to take in. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do? How do you get people to recognize their positive qualities? Well, it, it, it's a reflective process. And if somebody says, I don't have any, uh, you know, I, I'll look at my watch and I'll say, you know, uh, you came on time. Are you generally punctual? Oh, yeah, I'm very punctual. Oh, oh, well, I, I think that's a very good uh, quality. Anything else? So that, that because, uh, you know, we have, we are imagining uh, that, that this good qualities somehow means sainthood or, you know, you have to have uh, <laughs> done something inc incredible to have a good quality. Being punctual is a good quality, you know, uh, that's it. Uh, and then they say, well, I'm nice to other people. Well, that's a very nice quality. What else? And then, then it opens, the spigot opens. And I, I have one uh, of my clients and she has a list of 150. So uh, I always tell them when they get up to 20 and 30, you just begun. You just begun to get to know yourself. There's so much more 
uh, to who you are. And that's the beginning of giving oneself nourishing energy, which we need to do. We need to give it to ourselves. Uh, when, I, when I deal with large groups, uh, uh, usually uh, uh, I, I ask them, when you're hungry, do you go to the refrigerator and get yourself something to eat? And they like stare at me as not a trick question. What do you do? Oh, well, yeah, we get something to eat. Good. Uh, same thing. Nobody knows when you need more love or when you need love. So you either give it to yourself or you ask for it because nobody can read your mind. You know, we want, we are so afraid. I did a clinical trial, Danbury Hospital, Connecticut. And I'm dealing with physicians, nurses, residents, burnout, suicidal ideation, all of this stuff. And uh, uh, this was like the last uh, workshop that we worked on and they bought uh, that love is nourishment. They bought into all of that. We did a whole bunch of experiments uh, that, that, that they loved and, and worked for them uh, in terms of uh, you know, their well-being. And uh, that, so I, I knew I, I had to hold this till the end and I said to him, so the, the next thing I want you to do is just select one person that you know well and go up to them and tell them you want to have an unconditional relationship with them. And they stared at me <laughs> and they stared at me for five minutes because I refused to break the silence. I said, did I suggest that you take a gun and shoot somebody in the head because that's the way your faces look like. Like I just <laughs> asked you to murder somebody. Well, you can't do that. You can't ask somebody, you know, tell somebody you want to have an unconditional relationship. You know, they either do or they don't. Wrong, wrong. Nobody knows what your needs are if you don't ask for it or you don't supply it to yourself. Nobody knows. And then I turned it around. I said, if somebody you know well comes up to you and says they want to have an unconditional relationship with you, would you feel offended? Would you feel like you got shot in the head? Said, no. Well, how would you feel? Well, you know, it, it would be nice. You know, I, I would kind of feel honored. Oh, well, why do you think somebody else won't feel the same way? Well, what if they ask me what unconditional is? Well, then I, you know, I had given them a definition of unconditional, uh, and so, so then you just give them the definition: to be loving under any and all circumstances, which doesn't mean you can't express your anger. And that's what you're aiming for. It's like Dorothy who stepped on the yellow brick road. If you don't step on it, you never go home. You never get home. Doesn't matter if there's flying monkeys or whatever in the way, eventually she got home. So if we step on the yellow brick road and go for it with people in our lives and create the unconditional community we were born into, uh, what, what do people do with an infant? Everybody smiles and tickles them, and picks them up, plays with them, kisses them, hugs them. Doesn't matter how old you are. I still need that. I'm still waiting for people to pick me up and tickle me and hug me and kiss me. Yeah, nothing changed. Nothing changed, you know, except I used to be more quiet about it. I'm not anymore. I want your love. <laughs> so how did you get into all of this, Stefan? What, what drew you to this? Uh, My goodness. Well, uh, first, that's why I started with the continuum theory. I just couldn't understand why the worst is at the end of the lifespan. So there's something wrong with this. Because if I had the chance to create it, again, it would be exiting on top, not exiting, you know, death, so what? You know, but the experience isn't one of decline. That's, and, and, and then I try to figure out how that would be possible. And then if we look at the body and brain paradigm, uh, yeah, you know, it, they develop, develop, they stop developing. Now, what do we have to look forward to? Well, they both decline to a degree and then we die. So obviously nothing to look forward to unless the last stage of life is developmental, unless there's something there that's incredible. And hold on for one second, I'm sorry. Good, my wife got that. <laughs> Uh, unless there was something incredible that's still waiting for us. 
And what's waiting for us is the ability to develop self to a place of unconditionality because that is what's missing in the world. We're running around, we have careers, we buy houses and cars and we interact with some people, but people out there by the millions and millions need someone to give them some love, some caring, some kindness, some something, some interaction. And if you understand that that's what we're made for, that's our true purpose in life, and there you go. There you go. Now, now you can do your thing, raise your kids, have your career, all that stuff. And then at the end, just love. Go out there and find people, groups that need it and give it to them. Give it to them. I promise you, you're going to live much longer and you will be much healthier. Generally speaking, you know, this is, this is a theory. <laughs> a few years back, um, John Leland, who writes for the New York Times, had done a series of interviews with the oldest old, meaning over, mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the mid 80s and older, and uh, turned it into a book called Happiness is a Choice. And he, he the people that he interviewed um, didn't have a lot of money had medical problems, might have been in assisted living, had had a tough life, but they were giving love. They had a purpose when they got up in the morning and they were gonna say, this is a, a new day. What are, we gonna, what are we gonna choose today to make ourselves happy? And in turn, because they had that attitude, they themselves were reaping the benefits of the happiness and the love that they were- <laughs> Yeah, abs absolutely. The, the only thing that's not, I mean, they discovered this. These people discovered this. But we want, we want every human being uh, to, to avail, of them, uh, avail themselves of this concept, this idea that you have something to look forward to because the world is starved for love and you have the capability. So go out there and do it. And because you will find once you do it, you're hooked. It's, you can be addicted to, to being loving with people because it's the best feeling. You know, instead of numbing the pain of a lack of love in many, many different ways, like all these poor superstars, Michael Jackson and goes on and on, some of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they killed themselves. Why? Why? Because they don't love themselves. And they don't, they feel adulation, but they don't feel love, you know, so that, that it's very sad. But yeah, so we can redefine this paradigm that the best is yet to come and that we can develop ourselves uh, to this uh, human being who's actually was born to do this, forgot it, you know, was trained out of us. And now we're coming back to, to self, coming back to who we really are. It's a tall order to convince people that aging can be positive, successful, conscious. It's a tall order when so many people are driven by the thoughts that it is decline. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, our only choice is to either do it, go for it or not. Now, if we don't go for it, if we don't start saying aging is cool, why? Because we become our most loving self, uh, then we won't. <laughs> you know, If we do, like you're giving me the opportunity to share this today, uh, then we will. Maybe it'll take 30, 40 years. But I think this is something that's a little bit easier to buy in uh, than uh, smoking. It's a little easier to buy in because we're always looking for good news. And this is good news. This is good news. This is not bad news. <laughs> that aging can be something very, very special in our life experience and that we can all go out with a smile, close our eyes one night and not wake up the next morning and not because of illness, but just because, you know, we, we gave all we had and now it's time to pass on to whatever is next. 
So what questions would you ask this wonderful group of people who tuned in to listen to your message today? What would you ask us? As well, your I, I, I love to hear skepticism. You know, if you, if, you, if you think that this is somehow not the way it is, uh, let me see if I can answer that for you. Because this is the way it is. <laughs> we may not have any skeptics in the group. Oh my goodness! That that's because I talked so loud and quickly, or <laughs> or because the ideas were convincing. They were, but you know what? It's hard to get people to buy in that you just want to love them for love's sake, and not that you want something from them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, and so. Uh, uh, we just have to prove it. In other words, we have to be consistent with our behavior. We have to we have to be loving when we're angry. We have to be patient. We have to be honest and tell them when they hurt our feelings. Uh, these are all the, the other skills, the communication skills, the envisioning skills. Uh, so there are some skills that go with this, uh, but the concept is the concept. And it's it's a matter of, of, of discovering it. Uh, yeah. All you need is love, right? How many songs have been written about this? You know, uh, yeah. You know what it reminds me of? Um, Eastern philosophy, the path to self-realization is unconditional love. Okay. And then that's how you you become self-realized being. Right. The, the, the problem with some of the things out there is that they don't explain it in, in uh, what I would believe kind of a grounded way. So when people hear unconditional love, uh, and, I, and I've been working with this for 30 years, what comes up for them is, I, I, do I have to be a doormat? Does that mean that no matter, no matter how someone treats me, I, I'm, you know, I'm just put a smile on my face? No. That's not what it means, because the fact is you need to learn to nourish yourself first. So love yourself first, just like on the airplane, they say, you know, oxygen mask, put it on yourself first, then help other people. So if you love yourself, if you get to that unconditional place that is not selfish, self-centered, egocentric, uh, egotistical, uh, then you can say to someone, listen, I know you love me or care about me and I care about you. And I know you would never do anything on purpose to hurt my feelings, but what you just said or what you did, did hurt my feelings. So I'm, I'm just putting it out there for you. Uh, I'm, I know you're gonna try and be careful the next time. And then the next time you say, well, this is the second time. And if there's a third time say, well, we're gonna take a time out, there's a consequence. Let's kind of stop communicating for a week. And what I would like you to think about is, do you think this relationship is even worth you working on this? Uh, perhaps you don't feel uh, working on our relationship. Perhaps you don't think it's worth the effort, which, you know, sadly, I'll, I'll accept. That uh, we have to say everything lovingly and then lovingly give a consequence, because the fact is, we don't have to accept unloving behavior from anyone. Yes, Seba. You have to also develop trust. Absolutely. And, and that comes from consistency. The way people develop trust is if you're consistent. If you're consistent, they will do things to upset you. And if you're consistent in being loving, even in spite of, and yet consequential, then they will begin to trust you. You can't be one day this and one day that and back and forth the way parents are with kids, you know? <laughs> Stefan. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. So um, my husband actually, I think has been working on this stage. I. I in fact, he would articulate some of the things that you have said. Um, one of the things I've noticed, however, that seems to depress him, and I've been wondering, is there something that might help? And that is, um, he doesn't, he, he's been a very goal-driven person and mm -hmm. a scientific sort of person, and he doesn't seem to have a way of noticing if he's progressing 
in in this area. So um, so he has this goal. He wants to be this unconditionally loving person. He's searching out people to unconditionally love. He's working this as well, even on on um, self love, which I think is a little harder for him. Um, but I noticed he doesn't seem to, he he seems to be wanting to know a way to see if he's progressing. He's always had goals to work toward and to be able to say, oh yes, I'm getting better. Oh, I need to do a little more of this. So um, I don't maybe reading your book would be a step to help. Well, but I don't uh, know, do you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, June, can you? Because uh, uh, feedback. Okay, I, I just don't want to cause feedback. So, um, yeah, I, I, as you said, two things. One is that uh, uh, he's trying to learn to love himself and he's having more of a problem. So that's one of the problems that he's, he's actually needs to start there uh, because he will and perhaps you as the spouse can uh, tell him whether or not he's progressing in terms of self-love and there he can he can create uh goals like uh, a self-love might mean walking a little more or whatever it is that maybe self-love means to him so he can put it down and then see if he's actually moving in that direction the other thing that that you were saying is that uh, he's attempting to be unconditional with other people just ask the other people just ask the other people, say, you know, this is one of my goals in life to become more unconditional. And I'm just wondering, if, can, you, can you give me some feedback? How am I doing? You know, do you see a change? You don't see a change? There, there it is. So uh, I, those would be two ways, but he's, he's got to work on loving himself first and foremost. Are there any other questions um, or comments that you wish to make? Pam? Um, yes. are you... Terry has uh, a question. Yeah, I understand and I appreciate, Stefan, the, uh, the practical value of many of your theories. Um, but my question is, what is the scientific basis on which many of the theories are, are, um, are examined and I asked that question, I'm trying to determine, have you done any validity, reliability studies? No. Okay. I, 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 did, a, I, I did a clinical trial. Uh, I mean, not in, not in the realm of aging, not in the realm of aging. But yeah. you've, have, you've done some, uh, some clinical trials of several hundred people. I am is okay. With, with, uh, okay. with, uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with the theory of love, not not the theory of aging. Right. Okay. Not the and 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 you 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 know you have to know you have to be affiliated. Uh, uh, these uh, these things these studies cost money. Uh, and to be honest, uh, uh, I I never I I, it, I I hope it doesn't sound the wrong way. But I wasn't interested in the academic community accepting my ideas. So I didn't do, you know, publish. A lot of people said, you know, did you publish? No. Uh, uh, there were, uh, I, what I was always more concerned about was the 7 billion people in the world. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and, and by working with people, small and large groups, individuals and couples, uh, I got a pretty good sense of the response to the ideas themselves, how useful they were, uh, how people thrived. Um, the I, I, would affirm much of, I would affirm much of what you're saying because I see the enormous practical value in this. Oh, thank you. That, that despite the academics and their own um, um, <laughs> sense of entitlement and uh, well, whatever, however else. Yeah. Uh, this has practical value. Yes, for people. that's always that's what, what I, I thank you. At. Thank yeah. you so much. Absolutely. You know, that's why I put Thomas Kuhn in there, because I, I think that's one of the wisest things anybody said, that what holds science and, 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 and society back is what people think they know. And, and you know, and I'm not going to go up. I wasn't going to waste my time going up against it. 
So, you know, uh, you want to hold on to, you know, that's, that's all we are. You know, 2000 years ago, Democritus said that, uh, and a number of other philosophers back then said that the universe, the material universe is made up of atoms. They called it atomos, tiny, tiny invisible particles. And for almost 4,000 years, uh, humanity said, what tiny invisible, but what are you talking about? What are you talking about? So, um, yeah. Yeah, I hear. It. And it, it turned out to it turned out they were right because it made sense. So again, thank thank you for uh, uh, sharing that with me. Why well, we say, uh, Stefan, common sense is not common. <laughs> that you know what? Thank you, thank you. I I I, I will feel like that that is a, a very large. Uh, 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 how do you say it when you a very large compliment? I will take that as a huge compliment. <laughs> I think what we need to do is have you come back and give us a little lesson. No problem. I, I would love to do that, especially communication. Uh, oh, and yeah. yeah, we can get into awareness, vision, communication, and how these three things are have to be integrated in order for us to be really able to uh, uh, do this thing called behaving unconditionally with ourselves and others. So I would love to do that, sure. Do you wanna make any concluding remarks? Uh... No, I think I showed people, uh, you know, um, on the PowerPoint, how they can connect with me. I, I see a number of very good friends who've, uh, who've uh, <laughs> stayed with me, Camillo Davis, uh, Steven Goldberg, uh, Wayne, uh, so uh, we had a number of people here uh, that I reached out to. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy they uh, they sat through, uh, and 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 I have to thank your community. Uh, I, I see that people uh, really stuck with the uh, uh, the presentation. So that that's uh, very uh, encouraging. Well, you have something very important to say, and it's something that encourages us to embrace this stage of our life. Uh, this is a wonderful time for those of us who have been fortunate enough to live this long. And boy, have I lived a long time. So, <laughs> so <laughs> It feels that way, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, anyone who wants to be in touch uh, with Stefan, we, we gave you his uh, email address and you can feel free to contact me at mm -hmm. p ramsden at pssusa.org for any further questions and we'll see if we can't get stefan to come back again and give us a good practical lesson sure no absolutely absolutely yeah. I'm sorry yes I'm, I'm sorry i don't know whether this i i had my hand up and i'm not sure it was seen earlier oh, no problem yeah so since we seem to have a little time may i ask a question yep. absolutely um, is that okay pam yes yes absolutely oh, yeah, certainly my, my question is, based on what you've said, um, Stefan, it seems that self-love and self-acceptance is sort of a prerequisite, a very, a very meaningful prerequisite. So number one, um, I guess so th the way it's presented is sort of like, oh, well, yeah, you get that out of the way and then you just go on to unconditional love. <laughs> but for, for many of us, that, that would be, that, that in and of itself is a large project. So maybe you can speak briefly on that or maybe give, you know, f three to five fast track tips, uh, if you care to. I mean, that's, I mean, that's sort of mockingly, but you well, have a comment on that. I, again, you know, uh, the awareness piece, you can call it mindfulness, you can call it meditation to some degree, but just, just asking uh, those questions, which we never hear people ask us. So it's, it's kind of hard to dwell on them, but you have to dwell on it. You know, you, you kind of open the door by saying uh, it's permitted to love yourself. All it is is just a nourishment like air, food and water, nothing different. It's not, a, not an ego, uh, egotistical journey. It's, it's, it's a, uh, a rational, uh, practical journey. Uh, and, uh, and then what you do with that uh, as, as you're developing that awareness is you uh, uh, reach out to your community and, and, and show them your list. You have to actually write it down and you show them your list and they'll say things like, um, uh, well, you forgot this and you forgot that. 
And so you have to, you have to uh, be patient with the process. If the process isn't as large as it is somewhat lengthy and the more you immerse yourself into the process uh the quicker it goes uh so people who are working and 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 work with me once a week i, I tell them uh it, it can be once a week you have to immerse you have to talk to family and friends about what you're learning and and how it's affecting you and ask them what they think uh you know it has to do with the learning pyramid i i did what you would call a lecture here you know you listen to me for an hour and and the learning pyramid says that uh, people retain about 5% of what they hear. Uh, and if you write, then you retain 10%. And if it's audio visual, which I don't know, maybe this is, then it's 20%. But if you wanna retain 90% or more, what you have to do is discuss, practice, and share or teach. Discuss, practice, share, or teach. The more you immerse yourself in the process of of what are my lovable qualities. And the reason you're asking is you want to learn how to nourish yourself, how to nourish yourself. Because until you do that, uh, it, it is harder to connect with other people and recognize whether you're nourishing them or not. And once you do that, it becomes easier to say to people who are being unloving, easier to say to them, that was unloving. I know you didn't mean to hurt my feelings. I know you care about it, you know. My vision for the relationship is that it continues to grow and get just get better and better, but not acceptable. So please work on that. And like I said, by the third time, if you have to repeat it, time out, you know, let's, let's give it a week, let's give it two weeks, uh, radio silence, and you know, think about it because it doesn't feel good. And uh, I'm not, willing to expose myself. You have so many good qualities, but hurting me is not one of them, uh, you know, and, and, and you seem to do that uh, without realizing it. Now what you're doing is you're actually helping the other person to become a more aware human being. And if they buy in, there it is. You're beginning to create your unconditionally loving community, which we need because that's what we had. That's what we were born into. The parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the siblings, the friends, the strangers who smiled and, and, and waved to us and everything like that. That's what we need. That's what we need. And, and as adults, now we're responsible for it. Thank you. And I, I agree with Pam that it would be lovely if you would come back and teach a course, especially on communication yes. that's so, so well stated what, how you how you layered it sort of, um, you know, I know this isn't your intent, et cetera, et cetera. I think right. that that sort right. of sandwich is, is quite right. elegant. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And, and, and the vision is that, you know, my vision is for a relationship to just continue to grow and get better and better. So the other person knows you're invested in this relationship being a wonderful relationship and you don't accept that kind of behavior. Because if all you all another person hears is, I don't accept that kind of behavior. It's like, well, why, why should they put the effort out there? You know, maybe you don't even like them, you know, or, or something like that, right? No, absolutely. That, as I said, that sandwich, yeah. I'm sorry, I hope that's yeah. not a too gross of a term. No, 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 true. not at all. Yeah, the sort of, know. you know, the beginning yeah. of the sort of large picture, I the, the large investment, then the sort of the, the, the meat, the sort of the communication, and then also yeah. closing yeah. with a nice cushy piece of bread as well. Yeah. And, uh, I, yes, I, like I, I, I said in Pam, that would be a wonderful workshop. Not that. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Wait. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I see Barbara Schlesinger, Schlesinger there. Yeah. And Wayne. We have, we have eight minutes. I'm not going to cut you guys short. If, if somebody would like to say something, we still have, you know, I, I must have done really well of, of finishing everything <laughs> quickly. This is Patricia, and I, I want to let you know that you embody loving kindness. It's oh, thank you. Throughout, the, throughout your uh, presentation, you're giving us love. I can feel it, and I wow. thank you. No, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Yeah, uh, that's lovely. Well, I think we should all think about one nourishing thing we can do for ourselves as we leave 
today. I like that. I like that. Where yeah. the day ends, just one thing today, and maybe we can start getting into the habit. Yeah. Um, and of course, journaling is always good for for positive self-talk too. Um, so I think you've given us a lot to think about, Stefan, and I'm so grateful that you spent the time with us. And My pleasure. We will hopefully do this again and see a lot of you come back again. Absolutely. All right. I don't think I see anything else in the chat. Everybody's saying thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, everybody. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Shana, for helping. <laughs> yes. Uh, got you. a little stuck there with the. And there is Mr. Goldberg. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you to a lot of people. So. Thank you, Stefan. Great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We will bid you adieu, and we will get on this, uh, uh, on our, our goal for this evening to do something nourishing for ourselves. Yes, I thank like you. that. Thank you. I like the way you ended it. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.